Now let's go into a new chapter. This is actually my favorite chapter. And let's kind of get into the details. How does technology play into the new mental health paradigm? I've been in the tech, tech domain for many years. I basically believe that technology can solve a lot of things. But what truly inspires me is that technology has to offer in building communities, can address loneliness, and especially the pandemic now, and allowing us to truly share innovative solutions in the form of AI and digital therapeutics. So to explore this world, the whole new world, let's start with a panel, and these are dear friends. So let's talk about conscious investment in startups with three amazing entrepreneurs and investors. I've just really gotten to know them well now. Nate Jones, he's a partner in the venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz. Solome Tibebu, a digital health investor and behavior health tech strategist. She's passionate about frontier technologies. And David Kumaran, my brother Kumaran, who's a coach, entrepreneur, yogi, startup exec, motorcycle rider. Let's welcome them to the Never Alone Summit. Hey, how are you guys doing? Thank you for having us. Thank you for lots having us. Lots of love, lots of love. Okay, this is gonna be, you know, my, I'm really looking forward to this panel. We have 25 minutes and we're gonna to get to know some really interesting topics. I don't think anybody's shared these topics in the past. So my first question, when you all are looking at investments, when you're looking at conscious startups, what is the criteria? What do you define as a conscious startup and how do you kind of go about that? I'll go ladies first actually here. Salome. <laughs> It's really exciting for me and um, certainly something I can relate to a lot is what is the founder's personal connection to the topic at hand? Oftentimes, um, they really do have the answers within to serve the populations that they're looking to reach. Um, now more than ever, we've got mental health startups, for example, that are focused on specific conditions or specific populations. And it's just a, it's a different um, atmosphere, it's a different outcome when really that founder has a personal connection. So that's pretty important to me. Nate, hey, David, thoughts? Yeah, I think one of the things I look for really in, uh, in founders is that, you know, you talked about practice and sadhana in the previous conversation. And so I look at, you know, how do they currently define profit? How do they define what they're trying to do? And if they're looking at obviously the conventional model uh, and they're looking at it from that perspective, I look for the conscious elements of how is it not just about them, their team, something bigger, what they're impacting. So for me, when I invest in conscious founders, I look for that. And I think the sadhana piece is really important because if you look at, if they have some sort of practice within themselves and then they're able to kind of help their team and be contagious and be infectious, and be the light for their team, as well as the community they're trying to impact. So for me, I look for the sadhana piece is very important, some sort of practice, and what are their definition of profit and how are they redefining it for the new world? Mm. Beautiful. Nate. Yes, thank you for having me. And um, I've spent quite a bit of time um, advising mental health startups over the last three years, obviously when the pandemic began, um, that really picked up. We put together some communities on WhatsApp with founders of mental health companies um, to see how we could all band together um, to, to help the onslaught, the, uh, the second pandemic that was everyone being locked in their homes uh, for six to nine months suddenly. Um, what I look for um, when I'm speaking to founders that I've advised um, is a connection to the work. Um, what I mean by that is, um, you know, a general, a genuine uh, empathetic connection to what's being built. Many of the founders I've spoken to have a family member that's dealing with a mental health issue or, or are mentally ill and have to go through a treatment process. And because they've been intimately involved in that, um, they've gleaned certain understandings of where there are holes and gaps in the current treatment options available. Um, and I see a lot of empathy coming into the space, especially in the last five years, which is amazing to see um, because I, I don't think um, we fully understood um, the complete picture to how treatment should happen for mentally ill people, where it should happen, when it should happen. And startups are now thinking about that. Um, it's a great time for it as well as, you know, corporate spending on mental health has gone through the roof mm -hmm. um, because it has become a corporate productivity issue now. And so now companies are now seeing that their employees 
uh, need to be supported in several ways. And so it's an incredible time for new innovation in the space. And um, I welcome I welcome all the smart and connected and uh, really, really earnest founders that are uh, going after the space. This is music to my ears. I just begin to think, is this the 1% conversation I'm having? Are really people like you around? You know, because so much of the valley, so much of investment is about ROI, returns, likes, views. I mean, we have a society today which is not about Tinder. It's all about Tinder, but not about tender, not about kindness. Mm. I mean, David talked about we need new metrics. Is it time for us to redefine success? And what would that look like in this whole new world? Where it's not just about views and posts and comments, but it's not about like, but who is like you, right? What are your thoughts on that? Was that one for me? Anybody. <laughs> I'm going to go. Go for okay, it. We're going to go for it, you again. <laughs> go for it, Nate. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, look, like I said before, there, there, there are different companies that are going after different parts of this space, and I, and I love it. I love that um, kids now, teens now, understand that they need to balance out their time. And, you know, even the big companies, the big device manufacturers are putting limits in place, not only for parents, but kids. And that the numbers show that it's not the parents that are enforcing this. The kids are doing it themselves because they have a fundamental understanding now of what screen time is doing. Um, and so they're beginning to manage that. And, and what, I, what I'm very hopeful about, and I have two teenage daughters myself, is that the culture is beginning to change around likes and views and all of these things and the understanding of how harmful and toxic some of the culture around that and the race to become uh, an influencer and popular. Um, mm. The upsides of it are great, obviously. Um, I support influencers and creators in my business mm. in what I do. Um, and I think it's wonderful when you can express and connect with your audience and build your audience. Um, but the other side of that, while teens are developing, um, and young adults are developing, um, we're seeing that. But the culture is beginning to shift, like I said, to where people are now having an understanding of there needs to be balance. Mm -hmm. And um, I love startups that are entering the space mm -hmm. um, to help kids manage that, to give them other things to do to connect to human beings in a way that isn't solely based upon my own self-image, but more about what I can bring to the whole and how I can collaborate, which is much healthier and much more community-based. Beautiful. Solomon, you work with youth. What are your thoughts on this? Yes, I love that so much, Nate. And I, the only thing I'd follow up with that is the pace of technology and social media has evolved so quickly that we even we really do need new measure sets to be able to measure not just clinical mental health improvements, but really youth and adult digital well-being. Mm -hmm. So there are some interesting organizations who are doing quite a bit of work in this space. For example, Second Muse's Headstream Impact Navigator tool mm -hmm. has developed criteria to be able to measure uh, the digital well-being of youth. And, and so that integrates everything from social media, ed tech solutions, social tech solutions, to be able to assess what they're doing to youth and young adults' mental health and well-being. David, any thoughts? From your perspective? Yeah, absolutely. I think if you think about, you know, software is kind of eating the world, quote, some A16 models there, right? And uh, if you think about capitalism, capitalism is, needs a software update as well, right? Okay. So what, what are the new metrics that we measure versus looking at short term, which is, you know, quarter over quarter profits, looking at the long term investment of what we're building, right? So understanding what are the impacts that it's having on you, the founder, the builders, to your communities, your teams, your city, then ultimately the globe, right? So for me, I think understanding the, the definition of profit and really bringing some conscious elements to it where it's not just about quarter over quarter profits. We are looking at the long term, right? And I'm, I'm really excited with technology, with cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. I think there's a sky's the limit. And with, with blockchain, you have the ability now to look at certain aspects of things and tokenize it, right? And be able to say, this is the metrics, this is the way we measure it. Mm -hmm. And it's a tangible way of actually moving forward. So I think there's a lot of exciting possibilities, especially with that blockchain space coming to place where we can redefine profit, bring consciousness into capitalism in a very meaningful way. 
I want to start with you on this one, because you changed your life, you became a yogi, you practiced your sadhana. So you know what, in life, you know, you have a financial, you get a credit report, your car has a dashboard, but in the dashboard called life, there's none. So you kind of go into this internal dashboard, internal awareness. Share your thoughts and how can entrepreneurs not look at startups as a sprint, but it's a marathon, it's about resilience. So share your thoughts, I'd love to hear all you three people with your backgrounds, what's your thoughts on awareness, resilience, and building resilient startups? It's a great question. Um, I think, you know, one of the things is in our current system, everything is about speed. Mm -hmm. So you'll notice, right? Speed up, low five to seven uh, year returns. You know, how do we actually go faster and faster? And I think the new notion of slowing down and looking at what's happening within your own system and checking in, right? And bringing that as part of the equation of as you're building companies, right? As you're building technology, looking at your technology that you're building, who is it serving, right? Mm -hmm. So I think this notion of building very fast has been the theme since the industrial age. And now it's really looking at balancing that and bringing down, like slowing down to your point about the marathon, mm -hmm. you're going to be building a long-term business here. What are the, what are the things that is gonna be impacting? How are you, you know, what are you doing with your team? What kind of culture do you have within your company? Ultimately, that culture and that team is going to impact everybody else, the markets, and therefore the world. So I think slowing down is really important. For me, my personal journey, that was pretty much it, right? Like I've built multiple companies and I've really followed that mantra of like building fast. You know, um, there's, there's lots of sayings, fail fast in Silicon Valley, right? Uh, push, push to fail. Um, and I think those are great innovation um, parameters, but at the same time, there's this powerful notion of slowing down, listening, looking at what your actions are impacting um, and really building for the long term. Mm, beautiful. Solomay? Yeah, I would like to add to that, that, you know, we can talk here as funders and investors and what can we do to support innovators and entrepreneurs and their mental health and well-being and and helping them develop as conscious leaders. But one thing I found that's really important in my own journey as an entrepreneur is having those peer relationships for, um, you know, it's important to have all sorts of relationships like mentors, investors, um, perhaps employees. It's, it's a different relationship all around. But one thing that's in terms of the importance of mental health and well-being is having those peer entrepreneurs with similar backgrounds who are going through the same things. Um, that to me has has made a huge difference and I think it does for a lot of entrepreneurs. Thank you. Nate, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I spend time um, with founders, um, coaching and uh, mentoring, and I would say a good portion of my time is spent on the psychology, hmm. um, the ups and downs of running a company, um, high stress situation where um, decisions have to be made with limited to almost no data. And, you know, as a CEO, you get the blame. You know, many times um, the founders I'm, I'm working with, they have families um, and they've decided to take on this extremely stressful lifestyle. Uh, a lot of risk. They're doing it for the upside. They're doing it for the future of their family and to build the dream that they've always wanted to build to bring what they're bringing into the world. But the cost is high. It's a high cost to build these companies. Um, and so um, something that I've built into even uh, programmatically into what I do is we sit with our founders and we say, okay, is what's today? You know, is, uh, is the mountain on top of you or are you on top of the mountain? You know, what, what, what's going on today? And uh, there's this release that happens and, you know, they have to be, you know, they always have to show that they are competent and smart and strong all the time. And you give that space and you create that space. You say, okay, in this space, you don't have to be any of those things. You just be how you are and you feel how you are and it's okay to express and release. And you, you know, it, you'd be amazed at the sharing that happens in these kinds of spaces. Um, and, you can apply that broadly, actually, outside of startups um, to everyone. Um, we walk around and <laughs> we carry all of these different things inside of us. And, you know, society, uh, we feel a, pr a pressure from society to, to appear competent and happy and all of these things. And because of that, we push, um, so many of us push 
the parts that we should be uh, addressing to the side in order to um, keep playing that that role every single day. And so um, creating sp- intentional spaces is um, very, for me, very uh, a very critical practice for myself and then offering that also to others and others in my life. And I don't separate um, the people. So I don't say you're the CEO right now. And then when you get off of work, you're the dad. And then there's this other portion, these other two hours, you're the motorcycle enthusiast. Right. <laughs> um, you're all of those things mm-hmm. at the same time. And um, we have to be aware of, of that, that when we're dealing with the human beings that are building these companies, because if they're healthy, they're going to build healthy cultures. And those healthy cultures are going to be great places to work. And people are going to create space for other people because that happened for them. And so it's just an integral part of my practice. I think you bring up a very interesting point. It's called psychological safety. If if I'm not right, it was Google's Project Aristotle, which they said the whole thing about check your, what happened at home, check it at the workplace door. A lot of things has changed. Your workplace is now the house, house is your workplace, everything is kind of coming together. (laughs) And it says no separation, so psychological safety has a whole new meaning. Yeah, it's important. So I want to ask you all, maybe uh, if you want to share three things for people listening to you all globally, and we had amazing, we had Spotlight India and really talking about, I was so inspired this morning. In a country I grew up in, and we were talking about the new paradigm of mental health, looking at psychedelics, looking at the new, new shifts. And I was like, wow, this is really powerful. Give me three points you would like, I know Solome said, you know, mentors, it takes a tribe. Give me three people or three things which have influenced you or three things you want to share to prospective startups. I can start. Uh, So I think uh, for me, if if it's really about uh, awareness, so if that's the first step, it's like understanding without awareness, really, you don't have a measure of where you are, what's really happening within your body, within your system, within your team, within your company. So I think the first step is really cultivating awareness. So having that in place. Um, The second thing is, you know, I think reinstilling that awareness with with a sadhana or practice of some sort, whether it's meditation, whether it's Tai Chi, whether it's Qigong, whatever it is that you do for your practice that grounds you and also puts you into that awareness at a deeper level to maintain that. And the third thing is Sangha, um, you know, supporting. So community around all of that, right? So as you have your awareness, you're cultivating your practice, you want to surround yourself with people that empower and help you groom that new identity that you built. Uh, what I've always find with founders in, in, in general startups is that they're constantly going through an identity crisis because they're evolving and growing so fast that they don't have congruency with their identity. So having that community piece really brings that identity of who you are, that better person that's 1% better every day to, to that complete you know, wholeness within that person. So I think awareness, you know, sadhana, practice, and sangha community are my three. I want to ask you a question before we move on. You talked about community. Today, when we can't hang out together, when you're so distributed, uh, what are your thoughts on community? And then I'm going to go back with the same question. David, to you. Yeah. I think what's naturally COVID has kind of taught us is that everything is back to the village way of living. Mm-hmm. So if you look at micro communities, is, is the new thing, right? So everybody has their own micro community that they're building in technology. But if you look at from experiential living in your life, you probably have a really good relationship with the people that are in the closest proximity to you since COVID, right? So this is how we used to live as in, as villagers, right? As, as hunter-gatherers. Hyper-local, right? And uh, so I think it's going back to that. And if you're looking at what's going on, I mean, all the trends and all the communities that we're building, even the Never Alone Summit, right? We are a micro-community amongst all of mental health. So I think that's the opportunity and, and the beauty of where we are post-COVID. Beautiful. Solome? So besides uh, different types of relationships in one's network, men- mentors, uh, peers, or mentees, the other thing I really want to point out is um, while it's pretty obvious and rudimentary the the idea of regular wellness and routine around wellness, I can't emphasize enough how, especially for mental health innovators who combined with probably managing some kind of lived experience while, uh, as Nate outlined, a really stressful job. It is really important to take care of those things. And just a personal story, 
Um, so I struggled a lot with anxiety and OCD as a teenager. And ultimately I tried maybe four different therapists, four different medications until I finally found the right combination to be able to manage it. And then after that, it was kind of like, oh, wow, I overcame this. I'm going to go and give TED Talks and talk to different groups about it. And, you know, I've, I, I've crossed the, the, the threshold. And then after a while, the routine started going by the wayside. I was missing out on sleep and diet and exercise. And it just really created the perfect storm for all of my symptoms to come back in full force. And so while these are things that we hear about every day, all the time, it is really important. And for me, that's when I realized, okay, this isn't something I just overcame. This is something I'll be managing for, you know, a long time. And as a result, it's, it's become a top priority for me. <clears throat> Thank you so much for sharing because talked about anxiety. Anxiety is a precursor. People talk about depression. Anxiety is more pervasive. I've had my own share, when I, and I know a lot of people. I'm a, I do, I'm no self-mental hygiene, I have it. When I went through an anxiety challenge, I called, called up my good friend, Dr. Srini Pillai, psychiatrist at Harvard, and he gave me a technique. He called it circa, chunking, break it down, because if you have too much of stress going into the amygdala, then your prefrontal cortex doesn't process, so chunk it. Ignore mental chatter. And R is for reality check, control check. Do you have any control over this? The last one was attention shift. So really, give me the tools, and this is so important as we look into tools for mental health. Nate, your thoughts. Yeah, so the three things that the kind of the framework that I give people to think about is space, place, and grace. Mm. And so I tell people, always give yourself space and create that space. Always have an intentional place that you can go to and give grace to yourself and others. And so the space can be anything. It can be two or three trusted business advisors who you've deputized to say, hey, you know, sometimes I don't wanna talk about business. I just wanna talk about my life, is that okay? And I wanna be able to talk about what I'm dealing with, right? So that you can have that pressure release valve. Um, it could be a community online. Um, but finding that space where you can actually express because what I've learned is, is that with a lot of the people that I've worked with as founders, there's a whole lot of mental chatter that you talked about, mm -hmm. but it never comes out. And until you actually speak it out of your mouth, this is how I feel. This is what I'm thinking. And until you say it to somebody else, you can't disempower it. And so I, I, I encourage them to say what it is that's going in, in going through your mind. And then we can, we can disempower those notions, those assumptions um, that are so harmful or that are driving you to these behaviors that are not healthy, right? And then place. Is there an intentional place? Is there a park you can go to? Is there a, do you have a meditation area in your home? An actual intentional place um, where you can go to where when you go there, it sets you, it grounds you, right? And then grace, Remembering that you're never as cool <laughs> as you think you are on your best day, and you're never as dumb or idiotic as you as you think you are on your worst day. So you've got to give yourself that grace, and then you have to give others that grace. And uh, that's the framework that I that I that I tell a lot of the founders that to go through is space, place, and grace. Beautiful space, place, and grace. So we have three minutes, and I wanted to end it with each of you all sharing one minute and your message for the world mental health, technology. If there's one thing you want to share today, let's each take a minute and then share with the world. Okay, I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I think uh, it's very important now more than ever, I think since we went through COVID, the big reset, um, that we take the lessons of COVID and what it showed us. Um, we were forced to go inward. We were forced to look at ourselves a little bit and our lives got a lot quieter. Um, and I think going back to our noisy lives that we had before COVID is probably not the recipe for success. And so what did we learn from this big reset? What lessons are we going to take from this big reset as we reapproach our lives and the busyness of a schedule and travel again birthdays and weddings and business meetings as we re-implement all of these things back into our lives. 
What are the things that we've learned in the last year that we should continue to practice? Um, we should remember that. And don't just go running back to the way it was before, um, but make sure that we maintain balance. Thank you. Follow me. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Um, for those who are for those who are listening, a lot of the conditions we're talking about are absolutely manageable. They're treatable. They're manageable. And I know for me, I felt very unique in the symptoms I was experiencing. I had a lot of shame and embarrassment. But the reality is, they're so much more common than we think, and they are treatable. And so. I do hope that this conversation and this entire summit can inspire anyone who's on the fence to go seek out support um, to please reach out to that professional and get the help that you need. And for those innovators who are developing unique solutions to expand access, you know, stigma, unfortunately, is still such a huge piece of our world and creates a barrier for individuals to get the care they need. And so it's as an employer, for example, it's not just about putting out a solution for your employees and their mental health. They have to see leadership talking about how this is a culture of mental health uh, and wellness at your workplace. It's everyone from peers to managers to leaders, we need to have more conversations because stigma should not be a barrier for people to get mental health help. Thank you. And I think, you know, what Nate, to echo on what Nate said is really important. We're in a post-COVID world, right? The possibilities are endless. Ultimately, what you can design and craft yourself to be, it's completely up to you at this point because what you pretty much know and the world knows what doesn't work. Right. And 2020 has made that very, very clear for us. So looking at yourself from a completely fresh perspective, re-innovating yourself, looking at what are the things that you're truly passionate about? Where are you currently in your mental health? Is it that you need to talk to somebody? Do you need to reach out to somebody? Do you need to look at friends and people that you, you didn't talk to before 2020 and then you're reaching out to them now? So whatever the situation may be, the opportunity of the world resetting is an opportunity for you to look at your life and reset that. And something I always keep in mind personally daily is that I'm a finite piece of life, right? So understanding that we're not here long. And if you keep that in perspective, all of a sudden, when you put death up, everything else kind of just kind of falls to the, to the side way, right? So it's important to remember how beautiful life is. We're here for a brief moment and look at all the things that you can do to improve yourself your family, your community, and the world, and it all starts with you. Beautiful. So I'm going to basically probably end with one question, and this is a question I wanted to ask the three of you all, and it's my personal question on AI and ethics. I'm fascinated after I saw the movie Her, right? I said, you know, I can look at micro expressions and people can say, how am I feeling, right? And then I can look at my voice and tone and vagal tone and figure out, am I stressed? Am I anxious? I can look at electrodermal activity and figure out, am I stressed? I can, look at, I can look at gait. I can look at my position, lat long. There's so much information. Now, here comes the question. AI, privacy. The more data I have, the better I could be. I want to ask your thoughts as we move into this world of mental health, where there's so much information, data is there, being gathered. The data is going to help us. Uh, what do you think is your perspective on privacy, ethics, and is there a new governance required for AI and mental health to come together in the whole new world? That's a really good question. Um, interesting idea with a whole new governance. I mean, personally, I think there's a lot of opportunity in this space. Now, as you outlined, Pranacha, the idea that we can gather so much interesting data through tools like uh, AI to be able to better build a better picture around an individual's mental health. Um, likewise, the ability to scale mental health support services through AI and, and chatbots and whatnot, uh, I don't believe we'll be able to address our provider shortage anytime soon. But at the same time, to your point, I do think that we have quite a bit of ways to go in terms of addressing ethics, privacy, and, um, you know, as it has been in the news in the last however many years, we need more 
people who represent diverse populations to be developing these kinds of technologies. You've seen some of the use cases where um, the mistakes that are happening in AI when that's not the case. And yeah. so I certainly hope that's uh, one change that happens as we move forward. Yeah, I think with micro expressions, a lot of uh, things have also gone wrong, you know, and people have been targeted. So I think it's really important for us to have that. Have you seen, Solomon, have you seen any good use cases from your perspective of actually being done right? Before I move on, to... yeah, there. Are, I mean, at this point, there are a few different chatbots and and technologies that have had quite a bit of experience in the consumer market that they're now partnering with large employers and payers and to further scale their technology. So there's movement happening in the space for sure. Perfect. Thank you, David and Nate. Yeah, I, I touched on it earlier, but um, you know. And Solomay just kind of touched on it as well, which is there's an, there's an incredible amount of momentum around solving some of this from the employer standpoint. And because of that, um, that will make things easier. But there still will be an incredible wall culturally around the adoption because of the trust issues that are at an individual level, which I think is a much bigger kind of uh, barrier to scale than is the regulatory uh, mm -hmm. barriers. Um, and until those things, which are more of cultural things, um, cultural attitudes towards technology and towards like, what am I telling? Who, where is this data going to live? And like, you know, can this be subpoenaed later on? Or like all of these murky things that people have assumptions about. Um, those are kind of some of the biggest cultural barriers around this. Um, I helped a company called Crisis Text Line for the last few years kind of advising them and helping their founders and, you know, kind of think through what they're doing as well. And they, you know, they deploy at scale thousands of crisis counselors um, that are readily available online. Um, people like you and you and I go through their MOOC course mm -hmm. and then get certified. Mm -hmm. And then you're on the phone with people that are in crisis. Um, and behind the scenes, there's a tremendous amount of information those crisis counselors get access to, um, I believe. I don't know what the company's doing now, so don't, I'm not a representative of the company. Please don't um, hold me to this. But um, that they're, they're, they're getting a tremendous amount of information to help, help them scale across so many different cases um, because they serve a lot of people every single day. They take a huge volume of crisis texts every single day um, that end up saving lives, tons of lives. And um, it's going for it to scale. And you've, you've brought up a very good point. These tools have to exist um, because we just can't serve the population that needs to be served um, unless they do. And so I'm interested to see how this evolves. I think this next generation may be more open to it, but I do think we have some, some, some cultural headwinds. Great. David, any closing comments before we end? Yeah, I think if you think about um, what are the next generation looking for, Right. So if you look at authenticity, you look at transparency, sustainability, these are currency for the next generations. Right. So when you think about data, you have to think about data from the perspective of all those three things. Currently, if you look at data, there's a huge monetization component to it. Right. So what is the trust factor that the consumer or people lose is that we don't know what's happening with our data. So there's a lack of transparency. There's a lot of lack of authenticity of how their data is currently being used. And is it even used in a sustainable manner? We don't know, right? So if you bring those three elements and look at data and look at how that's actually going to move into AI and look at those algorithms, there's a, there's a tremendous amount of technologies and uh, innovation, especially in the blockchain space, mm -hmm. that naturally give you transparency, right? Give, gives you that from the day one so that consumers know as far as, you know, what is it that, that's happening with their data, right? Good example is if you look at companies like Patagonia, you're able to look at complete supply chain of how your product is made and you have a line of sight. So from the farmer to the sheep, all the way to the retail location, it's a beautiful way to build consumer confidence and that trust, I think. So they've done that in a well, a good way. Once again, so thank you. Thank you, Nate. Thank you, Solomi. Thank you, David. Really grateful thank for you, so much. you guys raising the vibration and bringing consciousness to the world. Thank you.